Welcome to Heaven Encounters. My guest today is Suzanne Seymour. She died in a skiing accident as a child. She met Jesus. She also met a special figure that is found in the Bible. She'll tell us about who this person is as we listen to her story. So Suzanne, it's great to be with you today and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Randy. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be part of your, your program. Well, likewise having you. And Suzanne, let's get into the story now. You right. were a child, I think, uh, what, about 10, 12 years old? Or, right, right. And uh, your family went on a skiing venture. And let's begin there and tell us what happened. Sure. We went on a skiing venture and uh, my scarf, when we finally got to our ski slope, which was remote, it wasn't properly, there weren't proper safety features. And it was, um, so it was a, it was a risky thing. It was a private hill. And that's important because there was no safety mechanism to stop the accident. My scarf got entangled in a nylon pulley rope, the ski rope and it hung me the entire length of the ski hill and it crashed my, phys my so my body hit into the poles that supported this pulley system that was housed at the top of the hill and there was no supervision to the to the um, booth because it was a blizzard that day and it was a private community and someone just turned the key and asked my parents to return the key when we were finished so um, there was no, nowadays they have trip wires and safety features and all kinds of things in place. But at that community hill, it was just pretty much put together for the residents and it was pretty relaxed. So when my scarf caught, <clears throat> it spirally spun, dragged me up the hill. And at the end, there was a cutout opening that I knew either my head was going to go through that hole and fit or, and go into those gears. And I, so I was imagining which way I would die because there was no escape. There was no um, hope, but I continued to fight. And in the end, I don't, I know my neck broke. And then I remember just being at the top of the hill and, and awakening. And when I, I remember looking and thinking, oh, here comes my dad, because there was this, it was a blizzard. So I saw this, it was white. So I, I awoke to what, is it a blizzard? Is it a white light? What is it? And then I saw this opening of through the trees and it really looked beautiful, like white light. There was almost like sunshine and gold. And, but I thought that must be my dad because it felt very loving and, and, and a rescue. And very quickly um, gliding over came um, a figure and, and he was absolutely beautiful and, his, and he let me know he was Jesus. And in that moment when he came close, the amount of trust and peace and comfort that I got immediately received from him was, as a child, you know, you, you have stranger danger. So this was immediately a, a connection of, of, of beyond anything I could explain. I, I felt that he knew everything about me. I understood who he was. I knew he was my creator, my king, my savior. And I use the word savior because he saved me and he saved everything about him was love and loving and peace it's just it was just it was a moment i mean when you think about it in my age now looking back that moment defined my life the experience thereafter defined my life and i might forget my car keys or certain details in my life but i can never ever forget that it was the most real formative piece of my life direction guidance, support. I've, I've never had an adult life. Oh, I should stay on course, Randy. I'm sorry. I just get so wrapped up in his glory. I just will glorify 
all day. So let me, Un- understandable, let me just, Suzanne. And so you let were me stay on track. This time is precious. Want, want well, it's to okay to go off track because there's oh, so. I mean, you were glory, looking at the glory, the glory. Jesus through the eyes of a twelve-year-old. The glory of him was so approachable and so magnificent and so loving that I I just completely fell into his arms and his hands struck me as very. He held out his hands to me, and I know now as an adult that at that time he was healing me because there was no medical or scientific reason how I'm healed. So I felt his hands was a great focus for me, and they reached out, and then he actually went underneath my body, and I felt like he lifted me and carried me. Um, And I thought, wow, and I asked him, and I, I remember communication wasn't um, like it is here. It's just so effortless. And he let me know we were going home. And um, I remember being excited because I thought, oh, I'm going to go home and see my grandma and watch Mod Squad and my TV shows and have my dog on the sofa. And I just felt completely at peace and saved. I had no idea that I had this mangled, destroyed, traumatized body bleeding everywhere and completely broken neck. I had no idea of that. I only knew that I was as happy as I could ever have been in a lifetime. And that joy and happiness that he radiated and the comfort and the peace, it's just, it stays with me and it has guided me all my life. So as he lifted me, we're, we're, I'm going to try to explain so people can get a glimpse and, and the blessings of Jesus. He lifted me And we glided above these trees. And I knew we were above the tree line because we measured later on to see how I was able to notice what my family was doing below. So I could witness that. And I witnessed my mother screaming, which disturbed my peace. And I realized that she was probably not going to survive without me. So I... So you could hear actually I, I could your hear. parents below uh, while you were in heaven with Jesus, you could hear them still. And I call it the flight. And I, uh, during the flight, I, I, I remember there were two angels with him or beings with, there were beings with like large, it just was so comfortable. They felt like billowy, billowy feather beds, like pillows for me. And I knew everything was very healing and comforting. I was probably being healed in the transport or at the site. I don't know exactly. But during that time, I call it the transport because I I heard that cry. And that disrupted this like joyful journey that I was getting ready to take. I was so excited. But the cry, um, it just hit me in the heart. And I thought, that she won't make it without me, will she? And I don't, I just, I wasn't convinced. Somehow I knew I was leaving my mother. And somehow, because all the information that you, I can only describe when seeing Jesus, every, every, every worry and concern that I had, I knew he knew of them. And I knew, I knew he understood what I was, what I was going through and what I was feeling as well as my mother, and as well as everyone. So there was a tremendous trust. But the calling of hearing a parent like that was very distracting. And so we continued the flight, and we arrived in the place I call heaven, because I felt like we arrived somewhere. And it was just magnificent. At first, it looked still snowy like where we were, but soon it all sort of cleared everything was clearing and the more it cleared the more beauty i got i i was able to see and then that beauty was absolutely mesmerizing and again mm. i i felt like you know i was i was just part of something that was so familiar and also very um it just felt very very beautiful everything was beautiful the the trees were beautiful, the grass, the scenery, the pe- then came people, I called them people at 12 years old. They were, or we can call them beings. Um, and they looked like they had a purpose. And 
they gathered in a, in a group and they were chatting amongst themselves. And I was with Jesus sitting with him and we were, <laughs> we were just, so I was so happy. I was just overjoyed. I can't say in my lifetime that I've ever felt that kind of joy. I, I can't ever, except when I'm praying or feeling the Holy Spirit. Anyway, I was sitting with him and, um, and I'm, we're watching and, and we're listening and I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but they would ask me, are you sure? Are you sure you don't, you want to go back? And I kept saying, I, I think I have to go back and help my mother. And they were concerned. They, there was concern and in a, in a very kind way. And I think, I think my personal opinion is Jesus was letting me see a bigger picture so that I would feel like my concerns were acknowledged. And I, I'm so grateful for that. I, I didn't feel like he was overpowering me or forcing me to do anything. I felt as though he was guiding me to see that there was a bigger picture and to understand the best that I could that whatever happened would be the right thing. And so when he did that, and you know, Randy, it was just fascinating to me because he showed me that counsel and it showed me also that they had a limit of what they were able to, to decide. And so they, they kept asking me, are you sure? And I was, I guess they were showing me their most beautiful landscape and it, it wasn't working. So they called in another council and um, they came and they were also, I could tell they were different and they discussed. And then after that council, Jesus and I were completely, you know, he was just, he just wouldn't, I never felt alone. He's, he's everywhere. He's part of everything. He's with you all the time. Even when another figure came, which after the second council seemed, they just seemed very at the end of their rope. Like, what do we do with her? This is. And then they, somebody spoke up and said, who's going to wake him? Who's going to call upon this figure? So it looked like they needed to call upon another figure in their process. And so no one really wanted to. And then in the meantime, this other figure appeared. And I don't know who, how or in the system he worked, but he appeared. And he looked like a little bit, I say grouchy at 12. Although it was just stern. He looked stern and he looked um, very mature and wise. Whereas Jesus with me was much more soft and, and, and strong. But, but this figure had a, had a little more of a, a stern and, and old. He just seemed like he, had, he was, t I don't want to say tired, but a worn, weathered spirit. And he arrived and um, he definitely looked very clear to me, more clear than other things. And he, he actually asked me to study his face. And I thought, okay. And I had no idea why he didn't tell me his name. And he turned his face to the side and then he lifted me and we glided. And he started to show me um, institutions of of wisdom or learning at 12 I didn't know much about universities or college but it, he let me know these were buildings that contained records and, and not records like on a record player he said records and recordings and um, he let me know that they that these things were were established and were known and and recorded um, and there, and it had to do with wisdom and his age. And so there was a lot of significance in what he asked me to look at. Sometimes pictures just tell a thousand words very quickly. So in the meantime, he showed me so many things, Randy, I could probably, I'd probably have to write it all down and maybe someday I will. It, I probably really should. And he, 
he let me know that he was like pouring information about things into me and that, that, that it would be revealed when it needed to be revealed. I understood so much wisdom, so much, in, in, so many things were, were, were infused with that experience. And again, there wasn't a separation from Jesus because Jesus is always with you. So even though I was spending time with him, I knew Jesus's presence was with me. And um, then we returned back to the scene where the second council was. And once I returned, I had a greater understanding of, of this big process. And they also showed me this big tree. And later on, I learned about the tree of life and all the different, different trees that are written in, um, in, in the Bible. And, and so I noticed this tree and they asked me to notice this tree. It was, it was just so much information. And then as, as that experience happened, I, I wondered because they asked me again, are you sure you want to go back? Are you sure? Are you sure, sweetheart? Are you sure you want to go back? And I said, I think I have to go back. And then they just paused like, you know, okay. And Jesus knew, I think, he, well, of course he always knew the outcome and how kind of him to let me know that he was, you know, how much effort he puts into each of us. In the same moment, because things happen in their own time there, a, there was a, a, hill, a landscape and, a, and these beautiful hills. And I could see these golden lights over, like right over the hills. And I, I thought, wow, that's so pretty. And who's over there? What's over there? And what's happening over there? And this magnificent light, and I call it the golden arm because it felt like this golden arm reached over, but it was light and it was an arm and it, it transferred over and it connected with Jesus. It touched him and he touched it because he's just full of light and they were one. And I knew they, I don't, I, I guess if you ever see a rainbow, but it was like a big rainbow of light that they were connected the golden light and then Jesus's light and they were one light. And then I knew it was, it was the father and the son. And I knew that it was all connected. Everything was connected and we're all connected. And I just gave me a sense of how everything is connected and how every decision made takes into consideration all these different factors and recordings and and there's no way we could possibly know all of that. So Jesus gave me that gift. And when that light reached forward and I, and I knew it was the golden light and Jesus's light, I realized he, the decision was made that I was going back. I don't think it was me saying it was go, I was going back. I just knew it was that decision was now time to carry through. And I'm, I'm sure it was Jesus's decision, not mine, but it was the best decision. And I understood that. So when I came back, he brought me back and he let me know he would stay. And they told me I would suffer. Um, they said, and I, I thought they meant suffering mostly because of what I'd been through. But more and more, when I think about the story, I realized that the suffering meant that life on earth had suffering. And that that cannot be prevented. And he cannot prevent, you know, here on earth that, that there would be suffering. And, and, and it's not that he couldn't. It's just that he let me know that I was not going to have special privileges. I was going to live my earthly life. And, um, and he would be there. And I knew that. So when I came back, I wasn't afraid of the pain. He said, not to be afraid and he would be with me and those were pretty much our parting words not to be afraid and he would be with me and you know very soon right after he waited till my mom came and when the entourage came to rescue me from my my uh, birth family they yeah, my mother said, who are you talking to? And who was talking to you? There was somebody here. Who were you talking to? 
And then she stopped because she realized there wasn't anyone and they were looking at her a little funny. So, but she had heard someone as well. And, you know, then we were in a very remote area. So it took great lengths of effort to get us to a hospital. Um, we didn't have 911. It was in the 70s. There were no cell phones. It was a blizzard. There was an, a volunteer security guard. My dad had to run to the nearest home in this summer community to find a warm body that might answer the door and could possibly have a car to help us because we hiked to the ski hill. So we didn't bring a vehicle. Um, every possible outcome that could have gone wrong in the rescue effort was, was not available. But finally we did get the volunteer. My, my father found someone, the volunteer security guard came. I just remember as a, tw you know, as a young girl, I remember I'm okay. I felt great. And they're trying to figure out there's, I did see all the blood then and the snow. I remember seeing just this red snow and everyone was just, don't pick her up. Her neck is broken. It could be broke. Don't move her. Don't do this. Don't do that. And so all of that ensued. They brought me to the nearest hospital, which was on the border of New York and Pennsylvania. I, we were on the border of Pennsylvania was in New York and it was a good hour drive. Um, during that time, I remember my mom being very careful, you know, that, that we didn't hit any bumps or anything. And she was really nervous. And I started to just calm her. And I was telling her, you know, she's like, why are you so elated? Why are you so overjoyed? How can this be? And I couldn't, I couldn't, she goes, you're, you're absolutely it is, you know, just so, so happy, so excited. So that was something I was just wanting to share with my mom and she just wanted to keep me calm. She didn't want me to move too much or get too excited. Um, I started to share a little bit about the story and she said, we're not, we're not going to talk about that now. We're, mm. we're just going to get to the hospital you know, we're going to stay calm. We're going to get you better. We're going to make, we're going to get you in, checked out. None of them could figure out how I was alive. And I think for my mom, she thought it might be very short lived because my, I had extreme cerebral swelling. I had, you know, the broken neck injury, which I know was healing as we were moving because there's no way I could have been breathing and, and all the things that I was doing. Suzanne, so the um, the experience you're at, you're at the, going to the hospital. Right. There's so many facets to your account. So you had the experience of the councils, plural, in heaven, who were determining apparently whether you could return or not, and you. It seemed that way. It seemed that way to you. As a, as a child in, right. in heaven with Jesus, that one figure, did God ever reveal to you who that figure was or any inclination yeah. as to who that was? Yes, many years later, um, I'd become a registered nurse after the experience. I studied medically to figure it all out. I, and it was always a mir miracle. It was a miracle. It was always a miracle. One day I, I was, it was out of the blue. Um, and, and I got the message of, of his name and I didn't even know how to spell it. And I wrote it on a napkin and I wrote his name Melchizedek. And I thought, who is this name? And I went home and, and looked it up and, and I thought, that's him. And I knew it was him. I knew the name was him. And, and then I tried to find information and pictures, but it's, it's very, very difficult to find. But there was one picture, and I'm glad I studied his face and I held on to it because there was one picture. There were certain features, and I said, "Oh, it's the nose." I knew the nose, like I knew certain features. Um, I'm, I'm blown away at at that. But then again, 
when it's the right time, they let you know what you need to know. So it, I was I was told in my 40s. That's interesting. Melchizedek is in the Bible, referenced uh, in the Bible, but remains somewhat of a mysterious figure in the Bible. I know theolo theologians have different ideas as to who he is, but you saw him and that was revealed to you uh, subsequent to your your fatal injury as a child. And then uh, Jesus, you had said, made the final decision. So we left off where you were going to the hospital, having gone through this experience in heaven. And there was an interesting exchange between you and your mother in which first she said, let's not share this with anyone. But what happened subsequently that, uh, you know, as you, as you uh, interacted with your mother and as you, well, as you grew? Ever, ever since meeting Jesus, things have, have so much fun in them sometimes. The supernatural is so fun. So we, we arrive at a hospital that actually was a hospital, I, I guess at the time, a Catholic hospital. So there were a sea of nuns that just surrounded me. And they knew that this was a miracle, according to their doctors, who had told them, we have no scientific explanation. Her injuries are remarkably healing, you know, right before her eyes. She's just getting better and better. And they were, they all were, you know, praising. And so for me, it was, it was absolutely lovely to hear other people praise the miracles that, that are performed by, by Christ and to recognize them and to be a miracle was something that just um, was, it, you're so, you're so forever grateful. You're so grateful for his love. Uh, and you are Suzanne. I know you as a friend, when we first uh, discussed your account and what impressed me, Suzanne, as we're wrapping this up, was that this happened to you as a child. And when you recount this, uh, it's almost as though you're, you're looking through the eyes of that 12-year-old little girl who experienced heaven with, with Jesus and these angels and, and councils, uh, as, you, as you mentioned uh, in your account. So I wish we could spend more time Suzanne, but it has been indeed a pleasure spending time with you as you share this amazing story. And again, thank you for being with us, uh, Suzanne. Bless you. And I'm sure others have been blessed by, by your account. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and our parting words are, well, for those of you who are in Christ, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until next time, Take care and God bless. Thank you for watching this episode of Heaven Encounters. If you'd like more information, you can go to Randy K Ministries at randyk.org. Take care and God bless.